Chapter 2. I'm here, not backing up. Emergence of grassroots militancy and armed self-defense in the 1950s. Bad Negroes spoke loudly and defiantly in Mound Bayou at a massive camp meeting in April of 1955. The accommodationist Booker T. Washington had dedicated this town 50 years previously, but resistance, not accommodation, was preached at the gathering. 13,000 black people from the Delta assembled to participate in the mass rally. This massive camp meeting was organized by Dr. T. R. M. Howard and the Regional Council for Negro Leadership, RCNL, advocating voting, civil, and other human rights. The rally also encouraged blacks to persevere and overcome fear and intimidation. The spirit exhibited by the RCNL mass meeting was truly a break from the strategy of accommodation. The defiant tone of the rally represented what Ebony Magazine described as the new fighting South. Today in Dixie, there is emerging a new militant Negro. He is fearless fighting man who openly campaigns for his civil rights, who refuses to migrate to the North in search of justice and dignity, and is determined to stay in his own backyard and fight. Something new was happening in Mississippi. Although white terror was still formidable, black people were willing to rally in the thousands for their freedom and human rights. Accommodationist black leadership still had significant control over black institutions, but they were being challenged by new assertive activists who attracted and articulated the aspirations of a growing constituency. Black leaders emerged to demand the rights of citizenship and to express the grievances of the black masses. What was occurring in Mississippi was connected to the struggles of people of color throughout the world. The decades following World War II represented a crisis for Western imperialism. Combined with the realignment of the international balance of power, new social forces among colonized and subject peoples asserted themselves. Internationally, militant voices emerged from the intellectual and professional sectors of oppressed nations. The end of World War II ushered in an upsurge in nationalist movements among oppressed people across the globe, particularly in Africa and Asia. The black freedom struggle in Mississippi and the rest of the South was part of an international movement to dismantle racialism, colonial rule, and apartheid, as well as to achieve democracy for oppressed people. Like anti-colonial leaders in Africa and Asia, African descendants in the United States emerged and demanded human rights for their communities living under apartheid. The rise of the activist leadership from the Mississippi black professional class is a consequence of the segregated economy. In the 1950s, black professionals, including doctors, members of the clergy, and entrepreneurs serving an almost exclusively black clientele became movement spokespersons and organizers. Like colonized troops returning to subject African and Asian nations following World War II, U.S. soldiers of color returned to U.S. apartheid from Europe and Asia. Later they would return from the Korean conflict. Mississippi activist M.Z. Moore was a World War II Army veteran when the U.S. armed forces were still segregated. 
Moore stated that black U.S. soldiers involved in the conflict wondered, why are we fighting? Why were we, why were we there? If we were fighting for freedom that Roosevelt and Churchill had talked about. Moore returned to the Mississippi Delta where some whites had mobilized to protect their communities from black GIs. Human rights activists in Mississippi did not miss the opportunity to point out the contradiction of U.S. troops of African descent fighting for freedom abroad while they and their communities remained oppressed in the southern apartheid states. Mississippi activist T.R.M. Howard asserted that black soldiers from Mississippi are fighting and dying for a democracy that they don't know one single thing about back home on the plantations of the Mississippi Delta. Another factor in global politics con contributed to challenging the apartheid system in Mississippi and the South. The accelerating conflict and competition between the United States and other Western capitalist regimes, the Soviet Union, as well as other socialist countries affected U.S. domestic politics. Quick to expose the contradictions of its adversaries, the Cold War utilized propaganda to achieve an advantage in the global chess game between capitalism and communism. In this context, racial oppression was an obvious liability in the United States, gaining leverage in the propaganda war. Historian Mary Duryak argued, at a time when the United States hoped to reshape the post-war world, post world in its own image, the international attention given to racial segregation was troublesome and embarrassing. The need to address international criticism gave the federal government an incentive to promote social change at, at home. The necessity of achieving an advantage over socialist competitors and reinforcing its image as a democratic state motivated the United States to pay attention to the civil rights of the oppressed black population in the South. In concert with the international situation, changes in the domestic political environment signaled new possibilities for black Mississippians and encouraged a new assertiveness in the face of white terror and domination. After decades of virtually ignoring racial oppression in the South, the federal government began to initiate a gradual policy shift. Federal courts began to challenge elements of white domination in the South. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed the Mississippi white primary in the case of Smith versus Allwright. The white only primary was a key pillar of white political power and an important way to, of denying the franchise of black Mississippians. The court's decision in Smith versus Allwright set the stage for challenges to racial voting restrictions in the state. White resistance mounted as white supremacists would not acquiesce to gradual desegregation by federal officials. In the 1946 elections, the first statewide poll since Smith v. Allwright, white supremacists, including U.S. Senator Theodore Bilbo, mobilized to prevent black political participation. Law enforcement officials and vigilantes physically attacked blacks attempting to register as well as the small number of registered blacks who attempted to vote in the 1946 election. Nearly 200 blacks testified at a U.S. Senate committee hearing about the white supremacist reign of terror during the 1946 elections. The internal social development 
of local black communities combined with the changes in international and domestic political environments allowed for a visible black freedom struggle in the state. The development of institutions, organizations, and resources in black communities were significant factors supporting the emergence of an insurgent movement. NAACP activity in the state was affected by the political environment that existed in the decade of the 1940s. The organization possessed only 100 members in 1940. By 1949, NAACP membership increased to 1,000. Black voter registration also increased from 2,000 to 20,000 between 1940 and 1949. However, the number of black voters registrants must be put in context. Half a million potential black voters resided in the state of Mississippi. Although white domination and racial violence was still commonplace, black efficacy increased. The development of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, RCNL, in the Mississippi Delta was the cornerstone of the surfacing black freedom struggle in the early 1950s. The appearance of a militant public leadership of the Mississippi Freedom Movement meant that it was necessary to protect the organizers and spokespersons of the movement if it was to survive. From Accommodation to Activism Dr. T. R. M. Howard was the charismatic leader of the RCNL. A native Kentuckian, the black physician moved to the black town of Mound Bayou in 1942. Mound Bayou was founded in 1887 by Isaiah Montgomery, the accommodationist black leader. Howard came to the Delta town to serve as the surgeon for the Taborian Hospital, a medical institution founded by a black mutual aid and secret society, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor. The Taborian Hospital served the Black Delta population. It is an example of efforts by black secret orders to use cooperative economics to develop viable financial, economic, and social institutions for black communities in the apartheid southern United States. Dr. Howard became one of the wealthiest blacks in Mississippi. Across the highway from the Taborian Hospital, Howard established his own clinic. The Mound Bayou physician owned a construction firm, a farm, and an insurance company in addition to his medical practice. A race man and an advocate of black self-help and economic development, Howard built a park, a zoo, and the first swimming pool for black Mississippians. Howard's efforts certainly contributed to the vision and hope of black Mississippians by developing a black oasis in the Delta. For many moderate whites, Howard and the self-help efforts in Mound Bayou represented racial progress. Southern liberal journalist Hodding Carter described Howard's endeavors as a one-man uplift movement. In a 1946 article titled, He's Doing Something About the Race Problem, Howard's demeanor in the article does not suggest the posture of a confrontational activist agitator, but rather that of a, that of a racial pragmatist. In the Carter article, Howard stated, I don't spend much time worrying about racial problems or tensions because I'm too busy trying to do something about them. Not much speech making, but doing things. And I think the Negro who is fortunate enough to be able to do something about the animosity should do it. 
instead of putting all the blame on the white men. Carter's portrayal of Howard's acknowledged the black physician's desire to bring progress for his fellows of African descent. However, according to Carter's portrayal, Howard did not believe in a militant challenge to Mississippi's version of apartheid. Howard and Perry Smith, leaders of the Knights of Tabor, became embroiled in a factional dispute inside the society in 1946. Howard was charged with being power hungry and attempting to enrich himself at the expense of his patients. Smith was accused of being autocratic and elitist and engaging in nepotism. After a contentious election, Smith regained control of the organization and Howard, his allies and his supporters founded a new fraternal organization, the United Order of Friendship, UOF, in 1947. The UOF opened the Friendship Clinic in Mound Bayou in 1948. At the 1951 UOF convention, the Regional Council of Negro Leadership was founded. The initial political posture of RCNL was neither radical nor confrontational. During the founding of the RCNL, Howard remained consistent with his seemingly accommodationist, accommodationist public image. He called for cooperation with the white power structure, not confrontation or resistance to it. In the published prospectus of the organization, Howard stated, all I ask is that we be consulted on matters that affect members of our race. We are not organizing to work against our white citizens, but to work with them. The RCNL's accommodationist public stance would soon fade as the organization began to organize voter registration campaigns, calls for equity in black in black public educational resources, challenged police brutality, and boycott gas stations that did not provide restrooms to blacks. The don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom campaign demanded not integration, but use of facilities, even if separate by black patrons. The RCNL began to attract brilliant young black professionals. Many of them were NAACP members from the Delta, propelled into leadership and activism. Clarksdale pharmacist Aaron Henry, Cleveland entrepreneur and postal worker Ainsley Moore, Belzoni ministry, minister and businessman George Lee, and Megger Edwards, a college-educated insurance agent, all joined and became officers in the new organization. Most of the RCNL and new NAACP leaders were professionals and entrepreneurs serving black people in the segregated economy. Activist Charles Evers stated that the RCNL and state and local NAACP leadership were mostly independent people who had their own businesses. We couldn't afford to work for white folks. They fired us. Those dependent on whites for employment cannot represent or be associated with the RCNL or NAACP without fear, without fearing reprisal. Henry Moore and both Evers were also World War II veterans. After fighting for democracy abroad, they were determined to have it in Mississippi. The new militancy and optimism invigorated the black freedom struggle. With independent farmers, professionals, entrepreneurs, 
and World War II veterans taking the lead, the RCNL and the NAACP began to function openly and to coordinate statewide efforts for voting rights and desegregation. The popularity of the RCNL swelled among Delta Blacks. The primary evidence of RCNL's popularity was the organization's annual tent meeting and rally in Mound Bayou. The first RCNL rally took place in 1952 with U.S. Representative William Dawson of Chicago as the keynote speaker and an appearance by gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. More than 7,000 Delta Blacks arrived in Mound Bayou to attend the event. A similar number attended the next year to hear Black Chicago jurist and politician Archibald Carey at the 1953 rally. In 1954, 10,000 Black Mississippians came to hear NAACP attorney Thurgood Marshall. 13,000 assembled in Mound Bayou to hear U.S. Congressman Charles Diggs from Detroit. The annual RCNL tent meeting was a combination of political rally and cultural festival. One black journalist described the RCNL rally as show all by itself with barbecue and soda pop, high school and college courses and bands and the speeches. The RCNL also utilized the large gatherings to raise funds. The organization reportedly raised $3,000 at its 1955 mass meeting. The Pittsburgh Courier reported that concessions at the event sold 3,000 tons of barbecue, hundreds of chickens, 500 cases of soft drinks, and 800 gallons of ice cream. Howard also served free barbecue ribs and chickens to hundreds of Delta Blacks who attended the event. In addition to the growth of the crowds, the militant posture of the RCNL also increased over the years, which is evidenced by the 1955 Mound Bayou Rally. One speaker, the militant minister, George W. Lee from the Delta Town Belzoni told the audience, pray not for your mom and pop. They've gone to heaven. Pray that you can make it through this hell. The RCNL encouraged the desires of Mississippi blacks to achieve the political franchise and ultimately political power and participation. Over six decades since the state's blacks had been successfully disenfranchised with the endorsement of the founder of Mound Bayou, Lee challenged the audience to visualize elected black representation. Reverend Lee exhorted, do you believe you can elect a Negro? Recognizing black voting potential in the Mississippi Delta, Lee predicted that someday the Delta would send a Negro to Congress. The RCNL invited U.S. Representative Charles Diggs of Detroit to address the rally. A state with dozens of black majority counties had not produced a black representative to U.S. Congress since John Lynch in 1883. Diggs spoke militantly to the forces of white domination, stating, time is running out in Mississippi. It is two minutes to midnight. When Amesie Moore passed out instructions for voting, he was mobbed by dozen, dozens in the audience desiring the material. T.R.M. Howard's demeanor at the rally could be interpreted as significantly different from his accommodationist statement in the 1946 Saturday Evening Post article. 
Howard's powerful and charismatic oratory could not be confused as conciliatory. Howard jokingly told the rally that the deceased segregationist, Senator Theodore Bilbo, was now in hell and had sent a direct message to the Capitol at Jackson asking them to stop treating the Negroes so badly in Mississippi and to give them a break because they have a Negro fireman down there that keeps the fire mighty hot. White supremacists intensified their economic harassment of black activists in response to the increased black activism and the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court decision in the case of Brown versus Board of Education. The White Citizens Council was founded in 1954 to coordinate economic harassment. The state's white power stance. The RCNL and the NAACP, however, would not be intimidated by economic pressure placed on them by the state's white power structure. In response to the white supremacist financial campaign, a national effort was initiated to establish a fund to support targeted black activists. Dr. Howard bragged, we are definitely whipping the economic freeze. At the same time, the black leader warned, when it develops as a real flop, the next round will be violence. Violent terror attacks emergent movement. Howard's warning was not without precedent. Dr. Emmett Stringer, president of the State Conference of Branches, NAACP, who was by this time a target of economic intimidation, experienced escalating threats of violence after the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown. Stringer, who practiced dentistry in the East Mississippi city of Columbus, was a focus of pressure applied by state and local white racist coordination coordinated by the White Citizens Council. Stringer's spouse, Flora, a teacher in a Columbus public school, was fired. The Stringers also experienced physical threats as well as threatening phone calls and letters. In response, Stringer began carrying weapons in his daily travel and was armed at home as well as in his office. A list of nine key NAACP, RCNL, and other Mississippi activists was published as a full-page ad in a Delta newspaper. This list was distributed at city council meetings throughout the state. The list included Stringer, George Lee, T.R.M. Howard, and Medgar Evers. The Citizens Council coordinated the financial harassment of those on the list, which included denying credit and mortgage renewals, and demanding that debt from an existing loan be immediately paid. Violent terror, including assassination, led forces of the black freedom struggle to believe that the Citizens Council list was a white terrorist death list. RCNL Vice President and local NAACP leader, Reverend George Lee, was ambushed and murdered in the streets of Belzoni on May 7, 1955, two weeks after Howard's warning at the 1955 RCNL mass rally. Acknowledged as the most militant Negro minister in Mississippi, Lee was the first black to qualify to vote since Reconstruction. Belzoni was the seat of the black majority Humphreys County. The Belzoni clergyman was planning to vote in the upcoming Democratic primary. Lee received threats from local whites after he refused to persuade 30 recently registered Humphreys County Blacks to remove their names from the voting registration rolls. 
2,000 mourners attended the two-and-a-half-hour funeral for Lee at Belzoni's Green Grove Church. At the funeral, Howard declared, We are not afraid. We are not fearful. Some of the rest of us here may join him, but we will join him as courageous warriors and not as cringing cowards. U.S. Representative Charles Diggs, the national leadership of the NAACP and the American Civil Liberties Union, all demanded a federal investigation of the murder of Lee Humphreys County Sheriff Ike Shelton proclaimed that Lee's killing was a freak accident. Movement activists and the Lee family felt the United States Justice Department and local authorities never really attempted to find the assassins of the charismatic minister. Another Belzoni activist would be attacked by white supremacists months later. Belzoni NAACP leader, entrepreneur, and grocer Gus Quartz was warned after the murder of Lee that he would be next on the list to go. Quartz was distinguished from his peers by organizing a contingent of Humphreys County blacks to pay their poll tax and register to vote in 1953. After being harassed by the Humphreys County Citizens Council, Quartz appealed to the state government for protection. Instead of receiving protection, Quartz was confronted in his store by a local Citizens Council member who possessed a copy of his letter appealing for protection. After the November 1955 elections, Quartz was shot in his store. Friends took the wounded Quartz two counties away to the hospital in Mounds Bayou. Due to concerns about the care Lee received in the Belzoni Hospital after his assault, Quartz recovered from the attack in Mound Bayou. Following advice from Medgar Evers, Quartz decided to leave the state. Escorted by the armed, armed Evers, Quartz fled the Delta to Jackson. After stints in Texas and California, Quartz and his family would eventually move to Chicago. An FBI investigation of the Quartz shooting ended with no arrest. In Chicago, Quartz was clearly a political exile of Mississippi apartheid. During a 1968 interview, Quartz reflected, I had to leave my $15,000 a year grocery business, my trucking business, and my home, and everything my wife and I, thousands of us Mississippians, had to run away. We had to flee in the night. We are American refugees from the terror in the South, all because we wanted to vote. The inability or unwillingness of the federal and state governments to find the terrorists who murdered Lee or shot Quartz demonstrated that Mississippi freedom fighters would have to rely on their own resources for protection. Notwithstanding the executive and judicial efforts towards gradual desegregation, some realized that the federal government could not be depended on for the survival of the Mississippi black freedom struggle. T. R. M. Howard in Armed Protection Howard had previously instituted precautions due to the increased level of violence. As his profile and militant activism increased, so did his willingness to practice armed self-defense. Howard's friends and associates knew he was willing to protect himself. Howard was known to have a cache of rifles and pistols in his, his home, which included a Thompson submachine gun. One visitor to the Howard residence had difficulty bringing a suitcase into a room due to a small arsenal that was blocking the door. The Mound Bayou doctor wore a pistol strapped to his waist. Howard associate and journalist Robert Radcliffe said he was looking for gunmen to fire into his home. When they come, he said, he once said, I'll be ready for them. 
In addition to having guns to protect his home, Howard traveled the highways of Mississippi armed. One could only carry handguns with a highway special permit, which blacks were generally denied. Charles Evers described this policy as gun control only for blacks. Blacks were randomly stopped and searched on Mississippi highways by state patrolmen. Howard was also often searched but had a secret hiding place for his handgun and was never caught. Howard commonly rode with his handgun cocked on his lap. It was common for rural Mississippians to travel with rifles in public view in their vehicles. Howard was not an exception to this custom. Memphis activist attorney Ben Hooks remembered. Many times he had high-powered rifles in his car. Three, four, five big huge rifles. In addition to concealing his handgun, Howard would use deception in other ways to protect himself on the highways. He would often travel to his destination via circuitous routes, including traveling through Louisiana from Mound Bayou to get to another Mississippi location. He believed traveling out of state was less dangerous than traveling in Mississippi. On one occasion, Howard rode in a hearse to conceal himself from potential attackers. Howard also hired bodyguards to protect himself and his family. He had round-the-clock armed protection of his home, an armed chauffeur, and security at his clinic. Even blacks who approached the activist doctor were often searched by his security people for weapons. Journalist Simeon Booker described Howard's security as a model of dispatch and efficiency. RCNL members and supporters were also willing to participate in the protection of Howard. On one occasion, when he was warned that a white mob was preparing to attack his home, Howard received a call from a Mound Bayou black farmer. Don't worry about a thing, Doc. Me and the gang of fellows will surround your house tonight and we all have guns. A rumor that white terrorists had assaulted Howard's wife, Helen, resulted in a rapid response of 15, filled ve 15 vehicles filled with armed blacks. The Emmett Till Case and Armed Security The Emmett Till Case created an increased need for t protection in the black freedom struggle. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old black Chicago resident visiting family in Mississippi in the summer of 1955. On August 28th, at approximately 12.30 a.m., two Delta white men, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam, kidnapped Till for the purposes of punishing the young man for allegedly whistling at Bryant's wife. Till's body, he had been lynched, was found in the Tallahatchie River three days after being taken from his uncle's home. After Till's body was found, NAACP Southern Regional Director Ruby Hurley Medgar Evers and Amzie Moore combed the Delta as part of an investigation. The three activists disguised themselves as sharecroppers, all wearing overalls and beat up shoes, with Hurley wearing a red bandana. Moore borrowed a car with registration and license plates from a Delta town. Armed security was organized to protect the three activists. Protection was there for me all the way, Hurley stated. There were men around with shotguns standing in various spots to be sure that I got where I was going and got back, she added. T.R.M. Howard also participated in the effort to find evidence and witnesses in the Till case. Delta Blacks contacted Howard with information concerning the lynching of Till. 
Howard utilized his resources to locate and provide refuge and protection for witnesses in the hostile environment. Howard also played a role in the case by providing logistical support, security, and housing for people connected to the case, including Till's mother, Mamie Till Mobley. Traveling to the Delta to attend the trial, Mobley received support from the clandestine network of the freedom struggle. She was escorted to a series of safe houses rather than taken directly from Memphis to Mound Bayou. She flew from Chicago to Memphis where she was housed by a local black doctor. From Memphis, she was transported to Clarksdale, Mississippi. In Clarksdale, Bishop Lewis Henry Ford, a Chicago clergyman with Mississippi Delta roots, facilitated shelter and protection for Mobley. From Clarksdale, Till Mobley was taken to Howard's residence in Mound, in Mound Bayou. Howard's home was described as a black command center and haven during travel. The prosperous black activists offered protection, shelter, and hospitality for Mobley, as well as black dignitaries and journalists attending the trial, including Congressman Charles Diggs. Legal and political strategy sessions took place each evening during the trial and included Mobley, Diggs, and Ruby Hurley, as well as Mississippi activists Howard, Medgar Evers, Amzie Moore, and Aaron Henry. Special security measures were taken to protect Howard's guests. Approaching the Howard residence, one visitor noted that you had to go through a checkpoint to get to Howard. Delta Movement supporters and RCNL leaders hired bodyguards who provided security for Howard, his family, and his guests. Mobley observed, the people in Mound Bayou didn't tolerate any invasion of any kind. If you were there, you had to state your business. And if they didn't agree with your reasons for being there, you were asked to leave. And that would be enforced. Mobley wished to attend the trial in Summer, Louis Sumner, Mississippi riding in Howard's convertible Cadillac. For her safety, she was instructed to travel in another car, which Howard told her was bulletproof and not identifiable as his Cadillac. Flowers were placed in the back of the vehicle escorting Mobley and others, who required special security so observers could not see who was riding in the car. The efforts of Mobley the RCNL and the NAACP and other activists and supporters to achieve justice through convictions of the murderers of Till was not successful. The trial lasted five days from September 19th to the 23rd. An all-white jury acquitted Milam and Bryant after a 67-minute deliberation. The acquittals were considered a victory for white supremacists, but evoked cries of outrage throughout the United States and internationally. Howard continued to campaign for justice through a national speaking tour, highlighting the Till case and other examples of white terror. Howard decided to move his family out of Mississippi in December 1955. Escalating harassment and threats of violence against the RCNL leader motivated the move. Despite his being well armed and protected, the tension of living in such a hostile environment became too much for his family. One reporter suggested that the Howard household was paying an emotional price for its participation. Visiting the Howard home during the Till trial Robert Ratcliffe of the Pittsburgh Courier observed, Mrs. Howard was worried. Fear was etched all over her pretty face. It's awful down here, she said. I don't know what's going to happen. One could see Mrs. Howard, a native of California, 
was concerned about her two children, her husband, and herself. Howard continued to aid the Mississippi movement from exile in Chicago. He returned to the South in 1958 to assist in the escape of militant journalist Arrington High from the State Mental Hospital, see Chapter 1. According to High, Howard initiated plans with the leader of the Negro Underground who facilitated High's escape. He also criticized the FBI for its failure to properly investigate white supremacist violence in Mississippi. During his national speaking tour, Howard pressed for a federal intervention to prevent the escalation of violence in Mississippi. On a national speaking tour in October 1955, Howard told a Pittsburgh audience, it is, a, it is practically impossible for a Negro to get justice where races are involved, are involved, unless the federal government can be made to realize how extremely serious the situation is in Mississippi, with tension mounting by the, mo by the moment in the hearts of both Negro and whites. There is going to be an outbreak of violence in Mississippi which will shock the imagination of the American people and the entire civilized world. Howard warned, the Negro fear in my state today is a rather dangerous fear, complex because he feels now that there is absolutely no justice he can expect at the hands of whites. He is going to have to, have, have to be the one who sees that justice gets done. 